Ladies, I want to welcome you all. I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women. And this is a special mentoring lunch with one of our most favorite conservative women leaders, KT McFarland. Now you all know, I think, at the Luce Center, we advance conservatism, both ideas and solutions, by promoting great women leaders like KT, who are role models and teachers to younger women, like all of you students here today. You are America's future leaders, America's future KTs. Before we do the intros, I want to give a special acknowledgement to Marie and John Lettuce, friends of the Luce Center, have been helping us for 12 years, live here in Kissimmee, Florida, and I just want to thank you so much for the help you've given us over the years. We're so happy you get to come and see one of our events. Great. I also want to give a special recognition to KT's daughter, Fiona McFarlane, one of the very bright spots here in Florida. On November 3rd, she flipped her house district and was elected to the Florida House of Representatives from the Sarasota area. She graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 2008, spent eight years on active duty, serving the U.S. Navy in the Western Pacific and also at the Pentagon. These are just two of the McFarland ladies. I would like to meet the rest of the ladies in your family. Thank you so much for joining us, Fiona. I also want to thank Julie Stewart, who put this all together. Most of you were in touch with her. She's inside getting the last uh, stragglers registered. And also Cindy Rushing, our development director. Cindy helps with everything. She always steps up, so it's great to bring her along, too. Now, I, I get to introduce our introducer. It's my pleasure to introduce Autumn Klein, who is a junior at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She interned at our Virginia headquarters this past summer. And you know, each of our interns is assigned to one of the staff members. And I got to have Autumn, and we had a great summer together. She's a solid, conservative, smart, hardworking, articulate, gracious, and friendly. She's a fine writer. She did some independent research for me, and she did such a good job that we decided to have her turn it into an article. And the article was published in The Federalist. It was about crazy women's studies programs. And uh, if you don't know until you're an intern in Washington how hard it is to get a piece published in a national publication. It was, it was an excellent piece. She's a woman of great faith. She not only holds conservative values, but lives her life by strong conservative values as well. And she snagged a full scholarship to her college and hopes to study, study law next. She's a dedicated traditional conservative woman who has a great future ahead of her. So please join me in welcoming our introducer, Autumn Klein. <laughs> Wearing her loose t-shirt. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm honored to be introducing our speaker today, a personal inspiration and a true trailblazer for conservative women. KT McFarland is one of the country's most prominent foreign policy experts, a leader in setting the conservative national security agenda. She's a frequent television and radio commentator, columnist, and author. Her best-selling book, Revolution, Trump, Washington, and We the People, has been hailed as a modern-day classic. Not only does it offer unique insight into the Trump presidency and Mueller investigation, but also thoughtful reflections on American history and exceptionalism. Ms. McFarland was President Trump's first Deputy National Security Advisor, starting with the Trump Tower transition and working as an architect of his America First and Peace Through Strength policies. Prior to her role in the Trump White House, KT was a Fox News National Security Analyst and appeared daily on all Fox and Fox Business News programs. She anchored FoxNews.com's DEF CON 3 and wrote a regular column for the Fox News opinion page. Ms. McFarland held national security posts in the Nixon, Ford, and Reagan administrations. She worked as an aide to Dr. Henry Kissinger, member of the Senate Armed Services Committee staff, senior speechwriter to Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, and later Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and Pentagon spokesman. Among other accolades, she drafted the Weinberger Doctrine speech, which laid out the Reagan administration's policy on use of force and the first draft of President Reagan's Star Wars speech. 
1985, Ms. McFarland received the Distinguished Service Award, the Defense Department's highest civilian honor for her work in the Reagan administration. In 2006, she was a Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate from New York. Ms. McFarland is a board member of the American Conservative Union, a former board member of the Jamestown Foundation, and a distinguished advisor to the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. She received a BA from George Washington University, an MA from Oxford University, and completed the MIT PhD program with concentrations in nuclear weapons, China, and the Soviet Union. The Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women named her Woman of the Year in 2015. And so please join me in welcoming Kate McFarland to the podium. Yay. Thank you so of much. It is great to be here. <laughs> In the free state of Florida, where we can be outside, where we can dine together, and, uh, and occasionally fist bump. Um, look, I, I just want to say how much I've enjoyed my association with my dear sweet friend Michelle and the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute. What Michelle doesn't tell you is that we were the two young girls, girls is what we were called, in previous administrations. So someday you should get her to tell you her story. Um, I always like to talk to women's groups because when I was your age, there weren't there were no women's groups. I mean, I never had any mentors there. I didn't know women who'd really even gone to college. I got a scholarship to go to George Washington University. I grew up in a family; nobody in my family had gone to college, and I didn't have quite enough money to make it through my first year. But I was a really good typist because in those days you had to take secretarial classes. So I typed my way into the West Wing of the White House, and I typed um, in the White House Situation Room. I was 18 years old, and I worked for a man by the name of Henry Kissinger, who later became a real icon in American foreign policy. As I reflect on my career, so I, I went to college, got a job at the White House, worked for President Nixon, and then left Washington to go to graduate school at Oxford and MIT and then came back as a proud foot soldier in the Reagan Revolution. And when we, after we won the Cold War in the middle 80s, I retired. I mean, I, my war was won and done. You know, I was a nuclear weapons expert and a Russia and China expert and we won that Cold War. And then after September 11th, when I was living in Manhattan with my five, you know, kids and stepkids, I was in Lower Manhattan on September 11th and saw the towers come down. And my daughter, Fiona, who is now sitting right there, Representative McFarland, she doesn't remember this, but when she was 13, and a real jerk, she <laughs> said, well, Mom, are you just going to you know, continue to have fun with your girlfriend? women first got the vote. My grandmother couldn't vote. She didn't have the right to vote. My mother did, but she never voted because, you know, women didn't really do that. That was sort of for guys. I was the first one, as I said, in my family to go to college and get an education and have a career. And I was at that cutting edge of, of the women's generation where we had no idea what we were doing. We didn't have plans. I'm sure every one of you here has a plan. You're gonna take this in college, you're gonna major in that, you're gonna internship here, and then when you graduate, you're gonna do this, and then you're gonna you know, take the GMATs or whatever, I'm gonna to go to graduate school. Well, there were no plans like that for my age group because they just didn't happen. In fact, my only, there was no role model to ask, she should I give up my brilliant career and go be a housewife and mother, there was one woman I thought I could ask, and she lived in the apartment building next to mine in Washington, and I would see her every day. Her name was Sandra Day O'Connor, and she was the first woman justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. So, you know when you go to like the neighborhood grocery store and you see the same people at the same time, you're buying your milk, they're buying your, you sort of nod, nah, nah, nah. well, I, I boldly, I mean, I can't believe I stalked her, and I went up to the, you know, um, Justice of the United States Supreme Court, and I said, Justice O'Connor, do you mind if I ask you a question? I mean, I have this amazing job at the Pentagon. I'm the highest ranking woman at the Pentagon. I love my career, but I can't decide, should I get married and like quit my job 
and go have kids. And Sandra Day O'Connor, who was the first woman on the United States Supreme Court, without missing a beat, she turned to me and she said, well, you know, I took time off to raise my kids and my career turned out okay. So I think that you should follow my advice. Well, years later, when I saw her and she kind, then I reminded her and she kindly remembered, she pretended to remember, I just thought it was great advice because you want to live a balanced life. And I know you've all got your plan and stick to the plan, but, but life will take in places you don't expect. Let me tell you what my plan was. So my plan was that I was going to be in the Trump administration. I was a foreign policy expert. I was on TV a lot. Um, I'd met President Trump. I gave him some advice during the campaign. And then he asked me to be the deputy national security advisor. So let me explain what that job is. You're in the West Wing of the White House. And you know, you've all seen like the TV shows and White House Situation Room and everybody's screwing around. That's exactly what it looks like. And I was President Trump's deputy national security advisor. My boss, Mike Flynn, had worked for President Trump on the campaign. He was the national security advisor. And we came in with enormous enthusiasm about redirecting American foreign policy, which we all thought, as President Trump led us, that had had 20 years of mistakes. I mean, wars in the Middle East that we couldn't win, um, not standing up to China, getting taken advantage of by China, and particularly China's trade and investment policies. And so we were really going great, great gangbusters. And then, sort of three weeks into it, General Flynn is visited by senior officials of the FBI and trapped and accused of various things and forced to resign. Now, this was a Russia hoax. This was the, cons this was the answer that the establishment was doing to the Donald Trump revolution. And the reason they did it, I feel, is that you know, Donald Trump represented everything they didn't want. They had their great jobs. They were part of the establishment. Who is this guy coming along? He's not hiring any of them for the important jobs in Washington. So let's just undermine his presidency and the way they did it. And they used the instruments of power to take down a, well, national security advisor. And they tried to take down a president. They impeached him twice. It's a revolution. And it's not the kind of revolution of the January 6th revolution. It's a different kind, and it's fought in different ways. In my book, I mean, I talk about my time in the White House. I talk about my time in the Mueller investigation. And after the Mueller investigation was finished with me, um, and I refused to commit, I mean, I refused to say that I'd committed crimes because I hadn't committed any crimes. I refused to implicate President Trump or other people. They had not committed crimes. I wasn't going to lie. But at that point, I left Washington. I left the country to try to get my head back together. Um, my career had been destroyed. My reputation ruined financially, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of legal fees later. And I think, what, you know, what's happened to me? What's happened to my country? What's going on? And I, I guess I reflected and I concluded the following. America right now is in the smack middle of a revolution. It's a political revolution. And we are meant to have political revolutions. And every 40 years or so, we have a political revolution. And that's because the United States is constantly changing demographically, geographically, technologically, economically. You know, again, women's rights, where were those 40 years ago? They didn't exist. We're constantly changing, but government doesn't change. Government just sort of gets in there, permanent government, and they just love it the way it is, and they never, they never adapt. They're not nimble enough, and they really have no incentive. So what happens in the United States is the American people rise up. And we say, look, you're not getting the job done anymore. You work for us. We don't work for you. And so we have a revolution at the ballot box. That was what the Trump revolution was, is to say to the establishment, you're not getting the job done. Your foreign policy is lousy. We have unemployment. You've forgotten about and abandoned half of the country, that, the part that lives between the East and the West Coast, and we're taking it back. And I think what we are now going through is a counter-revolution, where the establishment, the Joe Biden establishment, and even the establishment Republicans, they said, no, no, no. Trump, you were just a mistake. You're the American people. Go back to doing what we want you to do. Pay your taxes, be quiet, and don't think you're smart enough to govern. I think that what happens next is up to you. The same way 
that the Reagan revolution happened, and that's ancient history to you, but that was my revolution of the people taking it back. Right now, the Democrats and the establishment feel that they've won. Why? Because a lot of people don't care about politics. They just don't get involved. They're not learning the issues. But that's what's important for every one of you. If you really want to make a difference, run for student council president. If you really want to make a difference, go to your school board and tell them, no, you cannot cancel culture. You are not going to take Shakespeare away from us. You are not going to take George Washington away from us. You are not going to tell us what we should believe and what we can believe in. And by the way, we have social issues. We don't want you touching our stuff. You get out of here. So run for, you know, go to a conservative movement in your college campus. I know it's a lonely place to be right now. How many of you are in college right now? Or plan okay. Being a conservative is a really lonely place in college right now, right? You're accused of being a racist, stupid, idiot, I don't know, insurrectionist. I don't have to tell you, you're hearing it every day. Being a conservative woman on a college campus, that's the loneliest place there is. Because they want to accuse you of everything. Now, part of it is very intentional. They're thrilled at the thought of having women move to the side. It's only 50% of the competition is already removed. But they're really going after you for your beliefs. And so you're the battlefield. You're the people in your own campuses, in your own dorms, in your own neighborhoods, in your own conversation. Don't let them cancel you. Argue right back. You'll be exhausted by the end of the day and you'll feel lousy and they'll call you every name. But be I just remember being at CPAC in the 1970s and watching Ronald Reagan speak. I don't know if you were there, Michelle, but that was our era. And Ronald Reagan believed in certain principles. Nobody else did at the time. And he, with just the courage of his convictions, carried on. And he changed the world. We won the Cold War. I think Donald Trump is the same way. A little less articulate, I might add. But it's, <laughs> but it's the same principles. So. Whatever you're thinking of doing, don't just live nice, normal lives. Don't live in the shade. I mean, I say this in the sun. There's an expression that Cicero had of, do you want to live in the shade? Do you want to live in the sun? If you wanted to live in the shade, that's a nice, quiet life. That's easy. If you want to live in the sun, it's bright. It's glaring. It's going to come at you. But I think that if the fact that you're here, the fact that you're part of this organization, means you want to live in the sun. So go live in the sun. Now, I would love to take questions. Is that, is that allowed, Michelle? Yep, absolutely. Um, we have a mic. You can raise your hand if you're name and school. Okay, question. Okay, raise your hand. Don't be shy, girls. Okay. <laughs> Middle table. Stand up. Who are okay. you? Hi, my name is oh. Andy Martinez. Okay. I'm oh, I'm so sorry. You no, no, go. she's next. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. My name is Andy Martinez. I'm here with CBL Women. Um, I'm from the great state of Texas, Yeehaw. Um, and I was just wondering, how do you think we can equip ourselves to combat these narratives we're hearing on campus? I personally ran for student body president and you know the cancel culture is just crazy. Uh, all the liberal students were going on social media. They were like doxing me, giving my address out, <sighs> giving my phone number out and um, calling me things like a race traitor, a coconut, everything and anything you can think of. And um, sometimes I feel like the administrations aren't willing to help conservative students. So how can we speak out against this? You know, I mean, if it's, it's the hardest question there is, and you're right. It's one thing to get called that by your peers, and God bless you for the courage to stand up and run. But your, your at college administration, they don't have your back. But, you know, did you feel like you were doing the right thing? I guess that's got to just keep you going for a while. Just do the right thing, because eventually the country's going to come around. It did. It always has before. And the people who are the cancel culture, I mean, at the end of the day, they're not happy people. I mean, Michelle, you may not remember this, but a couple of years ago I spoke um, at the same luncheon, and a young woman got up and she said, well, what am I supposed to say to my colleagues, my classmates, who say that I should, I should only focus on my career and I shouldn't do anything frivolous and I shouldn't have, I don't know, I shouldn't have a boyfriend, I guess. 
And I said to her, well, why don't you just turn to your friends and say, do you want a happy life? Is this all that's in your life? Because I want a full life. And for me, a full life is a career, it's a social life, it's a family, it's having principles. And principles aren't something that you scream when everybody else is screaming the same thing. Principles are what you, what you say soundly and on your own two feet with confidence when everybody else is telling you all the things they were calling you. Because at the end of the day, Americans aren't stupid. Do you really think the American people want to believe in cancel culture? Do you really think the American people want to defund the police? Do you really think the American people want to, oh, I guess, tear down every statue of George Washington, rename every university? Oh, we're not going to teach history anymore. We're going to teach who knows what gender studies. And by the way, we haven't quite figured that one out, but we're going to teach it anyway. I mean, at the end of the day, Americans are not idiots, and they're not going to put up with this. The problem is you're then right there and you're hearing those, and you're taking those slings and arrows. But at the end of the day, you'll win. You just have to wait. Who was it? Somebody, Michelle, who said, if you wait on the side of the river long enough, the dead bodies of your enemies eventually float by. <laughs> now, we don't wish that on anyone, but I would say just keep at it. OK, lady in the white with the really cool shoes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Grace Aldania. I go to school in California online at Palomar College. It's a community college, but I live here in West, uh, West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, so you were talking about the revolution 45 years ago in the Reagan era, and you were lucky enough to experience the, poli the state of politics following that. Yeah. Um, so for s students like us who are going through this current revolution, it's kind of hard to see past it, like what happens next? Um, what kind of advice do you have for students who are looking forward and they want to see what happens next and the best ways to help fight the battle? Okay, what if I told you with all confidence that if you do the right thing for the right reasons, that eventually it'll turn out okay? If I told you that who knows how many years from now the country would stop being, you know, would wake up out of this nightmare and be the nation that you love. Would you be willing to put up with a couple of years of what you're putting up with now? Yeah, you would. I mean, one of my life's guiding lessons has been, you know, you do the right thing for the right reason, and somehow eventually it will come through. It, and it's a hard lesson for me to have learned. I was, I mean, my daughter will tell you, during the Mueller investigation, when they were coming after me with the entire weight of the federal government, trying to get to trick me into saying something, trying to accuse me of this or that, I was in my bathroom in tears. and. One, a very wise person said to me words back that I had said before. If I could tell you that this will all be okay in the end, can you get through it? And I said, yeah, I guess I can. And so I got through it. And just get through it. But here's what's going to Let me just, as a person who's been around the Washington and politics for, God, 55 years? Gee, it really has been a long time. Um, <laughs> even more than that. But um, these things go in cycles. Joe Biden, I believe, is Jimmy Carter 2.0. Okay, Jimmy Carter came in after um, Richard Nixon was forced to resign the presidency. And he was hailed, Jimmy Carter was hailed as he's the man who's going to unify America. He's a really good guy. He's not divisive. All things, you know, kumbaya. Within three, two, three years of his presidency, oil prices were through the roof. The Middle East was pushing us around. We were impotent around the world. The Chinese hadn't risen yet, but the Russians sure were, and they, the Soviet Union was on the move and march all around the world, and they, they built up their defenses. They were stealing our stuff. And America had high unemployment. Kids your age couldn't find jobs. They had student loans to pay. And God forbid they tried to buy a house or an apartment because the interest rates were 20%. That was the world that they inherited. But because of that, and again, because the American people aren't nuts, the American people said, well, we've had enough of this. We want Ronald Reagan. And then he changed and turned everything around. Now, where do you want to be on, the, on that cycle? You want to be one of the people who's saying, Jimmy Carter, Joe Biden, emperor has no clothes. This is not working for us. 
and you want to be one of the people who's knocking on doors. I mean, the greatest example I have is, so my daughter, of course, so proud of my daughter. We have five kids. I love all five of my kids. But Fiona McFarland, last year, pregnant, walked on, and for all you Floridians, you know what it's like in Florida in August? Right, 95 degrees, 97 percent humidity. And she was running for the Florida State House of Representatives from Sarasota. And she got out there every afternoon, and she knocked on doors. Social distancing, masks, and since she said, I'm running for office, I want your vote. And she and her team personally knocked on 25,000 doors. I don't know how many thousand people I called. Well, maybe not a thousand, but I called hundreds of people. And she asked every single person for her vote. And you know what she did? She flipped a seat that had been held by a Democrat by 10 points. Now, they did that in the middle. I know, pretty awesome. They did that in the middle of, of, of the craziness of the 2020 election. They voted for this person. So you can do it, but it's going to take a lot of work, and it's going to take a lot of perseverance, and it's not glamorous, but it changes the world. And so you've got to, and whatever you do, don't sit it out. You know, every generation has one chance to make a difference, and this is your time. You don't, you're not married, you don't have kids, you don't have a mortgage to pay off, you probably have student debt. But anyway, Joe Biden's going to probably cancel all that. Um, but this is your time to do it. This is your time to stay active, and this is your time to just pick yourself up every time somebody knocks you down and just keep going at it. Because in the end of the day, what they don't remember about the 2020 election, which you should keep in the back of your head, forget who won the presidency for a minute. Every state in the union, every congressional district, every state legislature, House of Representatives, state senate, gubernatorial, anybody who ran in 2020 who ran as a conservative Republican, they won. My daughter is the example, but that happened all across Florida. It happened all across the country. And the new Republican Party is not as the left would have you think, oh, those old rich guys who are racist and go to country clubs. That's not the new Republican Party. The new Republican Party is young, it's female, it's black, it's Hispanic, it's Asian, it's veterans, it's all of the above. And guess what? We don't care about those issues. We don't care about what color you are, what church you go to. We just care about the policies. And we believe in freedom, and we don't believe in cancel culture. And so we're going to just keep going. And those are the people the American public voted for. So really, Americans are not nuts. But you got to keep at it. you got to keep at it and stay involved for the next couple of years, hard as it is, even if you, like me, most powerful woman in the West Wing of the White House, senior architect of Trump's foreign policy. Again, I was crying in my bathroom. So it can happen to all of us. If you go home and cry in your bathroom, fine. Just get a cry, buddy. Mine was my husband and my daughter. But just keep at it. It's worth it because you can stand tall. Okay, who's got the mic? You choose. Okay. Hi. <laughs> my name is Elena Monticella, and I'm from the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. And my question is, what is something about the way Washington politics is conducted behind closed doors that the American people don't know that would surprise the American people? That, by the way, I'm a fellow Badger, having grown up in Madison. Um, that's, that's a brilliant question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. And I think one of the dirty little secrets in Washington is that the Washington establishment, the people who are there come president in and out. I mean, they look at the president and they say, ah, presidents come, presidents go, we're here forever. And the common cause the left-wing media, establishment media, has made with government, permanent government, particularly the, the intelligence community, is that's the dirty little secret. Let me give you an example. So we're in the West Wing of the White House. I'm in my office. Mike Flynn's 12 feet away. He's in his office. And I get a knock on my door. And one of the aides comes in and says, the Washington Post has a transcript of a phone call that Mike Flynn had with the Russian ambassador. And they want to have comment. And I said, transcript? Who the heck is wiretapping the National Security Advisor of the United States? Number one. 
Number two, I didn't even know this transcript existed and I have the highest security clearances in the country. And number three, what the heck was it doing in the hands of the Washington Post? That was the first, that was the very beginning of the Russia probe, the Russia hoax, which we now know from their own writings and handwritings and testimony was a hoax from the very beginning. But that's the dirty little secret they don't want you to know, that you think you're in charge, but they think they're in charge. And most of the time they are. That's why you just have to keep flushing the toilet every now and then. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Jolanne Mejias. I'm from University of Central Florida. Um, since you've worked in both administrations, I think ever since Trump uh, came down that escalator, he's com been compared to Reagan and called a Reagan-like figure. Um, since you've worked in both administrations, how accurate do you think is that statement in terms of policy and personal style? I know you said that Trump may be a little less articulate, but other than that, what would you say? Okay, you're going to just love this because um, when I was working for President Trump, and I gave him some advice during the campaign, foreign policy issues mostly, and I turned to him and I said, you know, it's really great. You're doing a great tribute to Ronald Reagan with your uh, motto of make America great again. And he looked at me like, who's Ronald Reagan? I don't care about Ronald Reagan. And I realized well, he, he, maybe he knew it, maybe he didn't care, but he was going to make it great again. And then, as I, and I write this in my book, I, I say, you know, every Republican politician since 1980 has said, I'm the new Ronald Reagan, I'm the one, vote for me. And the one guy who really was Reagan's heir, is Reagan's heir, is Donald Trump. Here, the, the comparisons are pretty stunning. So Ronald Reagan comes in after we lost the Vietnam War. Donald Trump comes in after we lost the Iraq and Afghanistan War. Ronald Reagan comes in when the economy is in the, just in a terrible position, high unemployment, stagnation, very high interest rates, Trump comes in. Ronald Reagan comes in, the Soviet Union is our major enemy, and they're, what they're doing is stealing our technology, and that's how they're having an arms race. Donald Trump comes in, it's the Chinese. They're having a different kinds of arms race. They're having a technological arms race, an economic arms race. The difference is that Donald Trump had energy independence. Reagan would have given anything to have had America be independent of Middle East oil. So yes, and the, and the solutions in 2016, 17 are the same solutions in 1980 and 1981. And that's why, you, you know, that's why you're conservative. Isn't, this is not rocket science. You know, you cut taxes, you deregulate the economy, and guess what? Private sector takes over. You don't have to give everybody a job. The private sector will take off. I mean, right now in the United States, once we're coming out of this pandemic, as we come out of this pandemic, the states that are free and open, there's going to be a gold rush. People can't wait to get here. I mean, I'm from New York, and you want to know who the Florida real estate agent of the year is? Andrew Cuomo, governor of New York because a thousand people a day are leaving the state of New York to come to Florida. Principles, conservative principles work and people vote with their pocketbooks and they vote with their feet. So Donald Trump may not want to know and acknowledge that he's Reagan's heir, but in fact he is. And he vanquished the same kind of enemies that Ronald Reagan did. I just wish he was a little less divisive sometimes, but frankly, I think he does too. Hello, my name is Victoria Espiato. I'm a grad student at the University of Virginia, which has forsaken Thomas Jefferson and all that stuff. You know. Yeah, uh, this, is where, <laughs> this is the great University of Virginia, founded by Thomas Jefferson, right. where they want to get rid of Thomas Jefferson. Right? Unfound, yeah. <laughs> so we'll wait for that statue. We don't know when that's happening. But um, I w I'm really inspired by your story and your life. In fact, I was just thinking that I would want my kids, when they go to school, that you're in their history textbooks. Like, I, w I wish, you know, we were taught more about women like you in the public school system, and we're not. And I'm actually studying teaching, so if I ever get to influence a textbook, I want your name to be in there. So um, I just wanted you to know that. But on that note, my question is, how do you, um, how would you advise students like us who are maybe about to graduate or trying to decide if we should go to grad school or even having stress about which class would best serve me for this job or this future? There's so many decisions that really uh, are stressful and um, 
we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. So I was wondering, with all the decisions that you've made and the different pathways you've been presented with, how did you know or feel that you were making the right decision or that, you know, oh, well, should I have done that or should I have done this? How, do you, how would you advise us going forward uh, to be confident in where we're going? You know, I think I had it a lot easier in a lot of ways because you have so many choices. You know, how do you balance this or that? I mean, I, you know, I, if I got a job, I was really happy I got a job. I didn't have those options. And so for me, the choice wasn't a, a this or that. And it wasn't even a lot of hindsight thinking because I was just happy where I was. And I just put one foot right in front of the other foot. And didn't, ha I mean, I had a long-range goal. But, you know, what, what is the expression? Tell God your plans if you want to hear God laugh. Um, I do think, though, if you find out who you are, that's the most important thing. I mean, wh when are you happy? What makes you, what makes you do? I mean, what stuff are you reading when you don't have to read it in a textbook? And the other decision I think that's important to make, not just where you want to live and what kind of a job you have, choose your friends well. I mean, I was really lucky to, at age 34, meet the man of my dreams, and, and we have been happily married. He's standing right back there. <laughs> he knows he's not allowed at a woman's lunch, Alan <laughs> McFarland. And that's your helpmate through your whole life. And so choose well. And wait. Don't, if you don't have the right one, don't jump. Just wait until you have the right life partner. And then if you make a mistake, pick yourself up and start again. It's not, it's not the perfect road. Remember, it's, it's the road that eventually gets you to d your destination. And be fulfilled, live a happy life, feel that you've made a difference. And let me tell you, if you're going onto the front lines of, of edu US American education, you are making a difference. Because that's where they're canceling the culture first. Yeah. So Godspeed to you and good luck. Hi, Madeline Stapel. I'm a freshman at Arizona State, but I've lived in Northern Virginia my entire life. Oh dear. Um, so uh, you mentioned that when you were 18, you took a job as a typist um, and that you were trying to, you didn't really know, have a plan, know what, what you were going to do. So as an 18 year old college freshman, what would be the advice that you would give to yourself at that point in your life? Personal in today's environment? Um, whatever. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, I just feel so, I, I just can't imagine what you're putting up with and not having in school, you know, in school learning and how you're trying to figure everything out, sitting in front of a computer, talking to a professor who probably doesn't know how to get off mute. Um, <laughs> but, but my advice to you is just, you know, instinct and gut are worth a lot. And the more you listen to that voice inside yourself, yet the more you'll hear it. And the times that you hear it and don't follow it, I know in my life, the times I've heard it and haven't followed it, I've always regretted it. I said, you know, I knew that was going to be a mistake. So follow it and understand that there's no perfect solution. You know, you guys are all trained to think, I'm going to have the perfect everything. There is no perfect solution. There is no perfect route. And the attitude of, I'm going to pick myself up and I'm going to redo it, okay, I may have made a mistake, but I'm on to the next, that gets you through everything. You know, no matter how smart you are, how, what great grades you have, it's the ability to come back time and time and time again. And at the end of the day, the smart person, he runs into a really big problem, well, he doesn't really adjust. The lucky person who got that great opportunity, well, you know, didn't make much of it. But the person who persists and keeps going and keeps going and keeps going, that's the person who lives a fulfilled life. Hi, my name is Taylor Walker, and I'm with the Great Florida State University. Um, I just wanted to ask you a more specific, perhaps technical question. You mentioned that one of your focuses was on China. Yeah. Um, so a lot of us at home have been actually watching over the past few years and watching the human rights atrocities that the CCP is committing. What I wanted to ask that, what can we, specifically citizens, specifically women, what can we do to combat this? We see this and we feel so helpful, what, helpless. What can we do to combat this? Yeah, speak out. Especially if you're on a college campus, speak out. What China's doing 
is they've taken the Muslim population in southwest China, they're called Uyghurs, and they have put them into concentration camps. The Chinese did this before, about 15 or 20 years ago, with the Tibetans, people in Tibet. They wanted the land in Tibet, they moved the people out of Tibet, they moved Chinese. Um, Han Chinese into the areas. They're doing the same thing with the Uyghurs. They put them in concentration camps. And yet, and we all say, oh, this is just really terrible. Well, guess what they're now doing? They're now burning Bibles. And if you don't speak up, if you don't hold them to account, nothing will ever happen. Because they will not, they do not have a conscience that says to, oh, we shouldn't be doing this. This is evil. They will only do something if they're embarrassed into doing it. Which is why I was so disappointed when two weeks ago, I think in Wisconsin actually, in Wisconsin, President Biden was asked, what about the genocide of the Muslim Uyghurs in China? And he had some, I don't know, word salad answer, but he then said, well, they have different cultural norms to us. And I thought, cultural norms, genocide is genocide. No matter who commits genocide, whether it's Hitler, whether it's the Chinese, whether it's in, in Burma and Myanmar and the, and the Rohingyas, you don't tolerate genocide, and you call them out for it every single time. Hello, um, my name is Mallory Finch, and I am getting my master's at Regent University. Um, and my question is, how can we articulate our conservative messages um, and talk about our values to other women who um, who are more feelings-based, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, how do we like articulate that? For example, if the left does a really good job of saying, we love you, we care about you, and we do too, but I feel like what we say, we say our message first, and then we have to like take you down the trail to like, okay, this is the right thing, this is why we care about you. Mm -hmm. Whereas the left can say, oh, I love you, here you go, and people just go with it. How do we tell our fellow women or like help them understand? You know, it's a great question, and I think that most Republican politicians have not learned yet. Um, without being terribly religious about this, Jesus spoke in parables for a reason, because people remember stories. We Republicans tend to quote the facts and the figures, and look at the unemployment rate, and if you do this with energy, if you do, people who are making the arguments to you, they're not thinking with that part of the brain that makes a logical argument. They're thinking with the feelings part of the brain. Meet them there. Talk about, well, gee, um, talk about a young woman who, who's a single mother who doesn't have an opportunity to send her, her son to a good school. What, and then what, what is the issue there? Well, how about school choice? Or talk about someone who is in, in Texas who just lost his job because of the cancellation of the Keystone Pipeline. Well, talk about all the people who are out of work. There's a way to take every issue and look at it from the human angle and the personal angle. And, and you'll never convince those people. I mean, you'll just all talk past each other if you try to make the intellectual argument. They're not there. You might be there, but they're not there. So make the emotional argument to them. That actually is one of the reasons I think Ronald Reagan was so successful. He told stories. Donald Trump tells stories. And you remember the stories. Hi there, my name is Chloe Piper and I go to St. Petersburg College. Um, I think one of my biggest concerns right now coming out of the 2020 election is just how much voter fraud was going on that's being kind of brushed brushed off by, you know, the courts and everything. And I'm afraid that's going to like set the precedent in the future for, you know, the 2024 election, elections in the future that when voter fraud happens, it's not going to be addressed. So like, I feel kind of powerless in that, like my vote is not going to matter as much anymore. So I'm wondering if there's any way that we can personally like combat this, you know, in our own way. Um, I probably should turn to my daughter and ask her about Florida because when Fiona was running, I would, she would give me a list of Republican, in the, in the primary, of Republican voters in the primary. And I would call them and say, I'm KT McFarlane. I'm calling you because my daughter's running and she wants to be your representative. But one thing I noticed is in Florida, come on up, sweetie. In Florida, you guys have really solved it. I mean, it was a mess in 2000, but you've cleaned up your voters' rolls. Other states haven't. So why don't you explain, you know, how, you, were, you told me once about the story of the guy who tried to double vote. 
so in Florida, we had the hanging chat in 2000, and we were the laughing stock of the country. In 2020, we got it right. We had all of the, the results tabulated by 9 p.m. on election night in the state of Florida. Um, what I would tell you is I can say this now as a legislator, take a look around at the difference, not the federal level, but at the state governments who are passing election reform. We're doing some here in the state of Florida. The governor just, the governor just announced it this past week. Um, what among One of the things we're doing is making sure that your ballot is never in anyone's hands but your own or the election official, right? So the, the ballot harvesting or these big drop boxes, that's something that we're very concerned about and we want to take a look at. Take a look at what, what states are passing election reform or, or considering them in their upcoming legislature, and then send that idea to your own state representative. Say, hey, I, I think that, you know, if, if you're not from Florida, say, I think Florida's doing a good job. They have this bill. Would you consider running this in the Oregon State Assembly uh, or in the Virginia uh, State House? I get ideas from constituents all the time that find good ideas from other states. And, it, you know, flat imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Help your legislator come up with good ideas because our staffs are very small. Hi, I'm Brooke Berry from Boise State University. From where? Boise State University. And I just had a question. Um, how, throughout your career, how did you know who you can trust and rely on? Whoa! <laughs> a big one. Thank you. How do you know who you can trust and rely on? Oh. Well, I guess the way you learn is the hard way. Um, I think that I finally, at age 70, come to the conclusion that um, who my boss is is really, really, really important. And sometimes you turn down the best job because it's got the bad boss. But again, follow your gut, follow your instinct. There will be a nagging something or saying, ah, it doesn't quite say, too good to be true. But um, as women, you know, we tend to be far too trusting. And we tend to think men are always going to do it right. There's a famous, I can never remember her name, like a Harvard psychologist. And she studied um, nursery school age kids. And she took early videos. And there were videos. So she'd be like at the back of the room. And the teacher would be sitting on the little toddler chair. And the kids would all be sitting cross-legged right in front of her. And she'd be reading a book. And she would say, who can tell me what this is? Well, all the little boys who were sitting right in front, they were all jumping up and down. I know, I know. Call on me, call on me. And all the girls, little girls, were all sitting in the back quietly, maybe demurely raising their hands. And that's how we are too often. Um, you know, women tend to under-promise. Oh, I don't think I can do that. I'm not sure I should. And then we over-deliver because when we get in the situation, we figure out how to make it work. Men are the guys in the front saying, oh, yeah, yeah, call, I know how to do it. I, 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 and then they screw it up. So I think it is... <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to be sexist, sweetie, <laughs> standing at the back there. But, I mean, it is, it, we're different. And so use that female intuition that you have that most men don't. And when you're in the back of the room, demurely raising your hand because you've thought about, do I really know the right answer? Just stick that hand right up there and shout it out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle.